Hey guys, welcome to Orbit, obviously. I'm glad I got that name right and wasn't, didn't say the wrong conference because that would have been embarrassing. This presentation is uh, what's so special about Halo anyways, where we do a deep dive into why everyone likes it so much when they actually start using it and what it does for your business and for your teams. Today, uh, we have the introduction of who we are and why you're listening to us. Um, not really important. We'll just skip right through that. We've got the a concept of contextualized data. We're going to talk about what that is and why that matters and how it impacts uh, the way you work. And then we have the concept of a platform versus a product. And then we're going to go into a live demonstration, which is why I dragged this guy on stage, uh, because I don't want to do it. And he offered. <laughs> um, so. Who am I? I'm Mendy. I am the founder of Rising Tide Consulting Group. You may have, may not have seen me on YouTube. I'm also the current CEO of MSP Geek. And this guy next to me, his name is Robbie from Renata, a chief technology officer. Um, you will have seen him on Discord. I don't think he's often on YouTube. Not as much. Not the as most much. recent video of ours is me, but uh, otherwise I yeah. try to leave it to Connor as much as I can. He's got to get his face out more. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about contextualized data for a second. And this may put you to sleep, but that's OK. But uh, hopefully not for very long. Um, when we talk about data, we, there's different types of dimensions that can exist. There's different levels of, of, of that data. And so for example, when we have a spreadsheet, we have two dimensions to that data, basically, a row and a column. And what we often see, especially if you're in IT, as an IT person getting a call from a client, is you'll get a phone call saying, hey, I have a spreadsheet that's going slow, and I need help with it. Uh, and it's a 100,000 tab spreadsheet with a ton of data inside of it, with lots of calculations. And if you're looking at it, and you're going, like, really, this should be inside of a database or some application. It doesn't really belong in a spreadsheet. And the client goes, like, why not? Like, I don't understand. It's all here. It's working. Like, it was working yesterday. Can you just fix it for me? And what we end up trying to explain is the fact that the amount of data that they're managing, that they're working with, is so complicated that the spreadsheet becomes unmanageable. You can do it, but we need, without additional levels of complexity that the database offers, the different dimensions that the database offers, we can't really do as much with that data. Another example, which is much easier to digest, is a password manager. If a client calls in, they're storing their passwords inside of a plain text document or spreadsheet. Obviously, it's a bad idea for security reasons. But for our purposes today in this uh, session, I don't care about the security. I care about the fact that we can um, assign properties to the different types of data. So we can say, this text is the username. This text is the password. And that's what I mean when I say contextualizing the data and creating a dimension for it. With these different context, uh, co contexts <laughs> and dimensions to that data, we're able to then do things like auto-populate the password form or username field on a website. We can do something like a uh, password breach detection by running it through compromised passwords on the dark web or stuff like that, which we can't really do if it's just inside of a spreadsheet. We can't process. We don't know which cell is what. You know? And we can create a fake dimension, like a fake organization, by putting headers on the spreadsheet. But it's not the same thing as assigning a specific attribute property type to that data type. Um, I need to read my notes so I can find where I left off and what I'm continuing. <laughs> uh, but the point is, is that when we add this context, it gives us the ability to do things to the data that we weren't previously able to do. Like It allows us to drive process, to drive reporting off that specific data type. And it allows us to basically do almost anything that we want as long as we can imagine doing it. The more dimensions that we add, the more context we add, the more ways that we can interact with that data. Um, so in my life, I've been through the MSP journey. Uh, anyone who's been in MSP for, I don't know, 20 or plus years, you've gone through the same journey that I've gone through, where ticketing started off inside of an email. And there was no real ticketing system, per se. You were just receiving emails from clients. Maybe you took a phone call and you wrote some notes somewhere. Uh, maybe you were using QuickBooks to track time or something like that. But it was very, very much disorganized. And you were scheduling things in your Outlook calendar. You'd have tasks and follow-ups. 
and stuff like that. But over time, we eventually, over the years, migrated to uh, using a ticketing system. Right? So like in my life, I, was, I started off at the MSP. We moved to Autotask. And Autotask was our ticketing system. And then from there, we moved to, uh, we were doing on-site visits everywhere. And we, we didn't really utilize an RMM in, in the beginning. And then we started using uh, Zenith slash Continuum before the split. And then uh, Control IT Support 247, now, now it's ConnectWise. And we moved from Autotask IT Support 247 to ConnectWise Manage and Automate, which will be important later on, maybe. Um, but the key is, is that with the ticketing system, we were able to suddenly assign context to this data. Previously, we had an email chain. If you want to go find what happened on a ticket and the work that you've done, you're searching your Outlook, or you're trying to find your notes in QuickBooks, and maybe like this invoice number or this email chain has the details, and we don't really know how much time we spent. With the ticketing system, we're able to assign like a series of a set of metadata around the ticket. How much time was actually worked on that ticket? When was that work done? Who worked on it? Um, you know, how much time did it take to do a specific set of work? And it also allowed us to centralize that data that's been going on. Now, if we want to go find what happened to this client, we have a client record that we can go find all related tickets for. And we can go see the time of day it was, who worked on it, and so on and so forth. And this is basically adding a context and levels of dimension to data that was life-changing for the MSP industry, uh, to the point where we were suddenly able to start pulling KPIs and reports. Right? So like, everything that we talk about today regarding scale, growth, and stuff like that, it all gets driven by KPIs from profitability, from service uh, delivery, and so on and so forth. That's all because we're able to, con to put context to the data that's coming in. And so then we can start pulling that report that drives our decisions on what's going on and what we need to do to do that scale and growth. Um, where was I? <laughs> uh, we talked about that. And yeah, I think the reason why I'm lost is because I'm supposed to be on the next slide. Right? Basically, with, this, with these metrics and reports that we're pulling, we ran into essentially the next set of problems that we've unearthed. And that was that technicians don't really like documenting. Uh, time doesn't get entered real time. You know, notes that were entered in real time are not always accurate. Sometimes it wasn't coded correctly. Right? Like with the context that it came with, suddenly our, our entire billing changed. We were able to invoice correctly. We can invoice for the amount of time. We can decide to invoice or not invoice based off a of contract being assigned. Right? All, this, all these things that we can now do with this level of context from a ticketing system, it's something that we never had the ability to do now before, I mean, is, is, was all new and fresh, but it relied heavily on the data being input correctly. And so we had all these challenges we have to deal with with our team, managing the team and stuff like that. We've built processes, both pre and post working on the ticket, to start addressing these challenges. Right? Some people will have a service coordinator that are reviewing the tickets before it even gets assigned. The dispatcher, before it even gets assigned to the technician, will go through the ticket and make sure it's set up for success, quote unquote. Right? It's a tagline a lot of consultants like to use, is they, they want to make sure the ticket is set up for success so the technician doesn't have to worry or think about what the, what the client has or doesn't have. Um, and they just focus on doing the work. And then after that, when the ticket's done, guess what? It doesn't get completed. It doesn't get sent to billing right away. It still goes through a review process. It gets sent back to a person to make sure, a manager to go through and make sure that the time was entered correctly, that the contract was correctly associated if there was one. If that, if that work was meant to be billed, it's set to be billable. And we're essentially doubling the amount of labor we're putting into a ticket, right? Because we're doing management work ahead, we're doing management work behind, because we want to make sure that, te that the technician was doing it correctly and we're, we're able to bill correctly. Even with that, it's still worth it. And that's the level of, just to give you an idea of what that context can give us in terms of power and what we're able to do. Um, if it's not in a ticket, it didn't happen. I was meant to actually call it out. That was a, a tagline I think invented, I believe, by ConnectWise back in the day. Our, our solution to the, to the technician not doing it correctly was this overhead and then the policy and process that said, like, we need to make sure we're getting 95 plus percent billability. We're make sure, we have to make sure we're getting all the notes in the ticket, it has to be real-time time entries, all these things that we basically insisted on doing. Um, so imagine, instead, a world where 
instead of having this, all this overhead I just described, which was currently what most MSPs are doing right now in some way, shape, or form, we have a world where the technician is presented with information that is relevant to the work that they're doing, that the values that they need to put in are restricted to only be relevant to the work that they're doing. If it's a value that's a single value that makes sense for that work, it's, con it's contextualized to make sure it's already preset. And so on screen, what we can see are two examples. One on the far, I don't know, right or left, but the far one, it's a form on a website, is a ticket. And this is a ticket where we design a process for the user to go and create. And it may not work all the time. We'll talk about that in a bit. But you know, in the event that we can get them to go to a form, so like a new user form, a new user creation, a user leaving, a new request, install, new hardware, whatever, if we can get them to a form, that form becomes dynamic. And that form is literally asking questions that are relevant to the work or that they're requesting. And the details that we provide back and the details that they put in is very specific and contextualized. Or on the closer screenshot to me, this one right here, we have actions that are being done. We don't have technicians putting in generic, random, freeform time entries. They are putting in a specific action with an outcome aligned to the work that just happened. And that action has contextualized values regarding what they're doing. So for example, this is a close action. Um, actually, hold on. Here we go. Here's a closer, bigger picture of the ticket itself. So this is what the client fills in. Are you a new client or are you an existing client? You know, what, what, is, what is it that you're looking for specifically? And we filter down the options. And it's a dynamic form that as you pick stuff, more options come up that are relevant to what they've picked. Right? As far as a technician, on the technician side, what that looks like over here is I'm doing a close action on a ticket. I'm closing the ticket. And so I'm asking for resolution notes. I'm prompting for a KB article. I have this checkbox is called, do I generate an AI article, which is something that I have working and does work great if I want it to. But if I don't have AI tied in, I don't believe in it, and I want to do something else, or if there's any other process as part of the closing, I can put it as part of the form that the technician fills out when they're closing a ticket. People hear form and they run away. They're like, oh, it's too, that's too complicated. Right? There's too many values to fill in for a technician. They're just closing tickets and moving on to the next one. But a form can literally be a two-question, um, two-field submission. It doesn't have to be a long, crazy, super enhanced form. Uh, but the idea is, is that with forms, we are able to contextualize the data so that anything that gets entered gets put into the right place, just like a password manager. You are putting a property to the value that's being entered, which allows us to drive things such as, if we wanted to. Um, <laughs> I'm looking at, at you because you did this, where we can do a, a new user ticket yep. automatically create the new user because we know exactly what the username is, right? Yeah. Um, this is something I tell clients, I'm going off script. <laughs> something I tell my clients a lot is that, uh, you know, it's not IT's responsibility to create a new user, right? It's not IT's responsibility to know who's working at what company. It's HR's responsibility. The only reason why IT gets involved is because we're the ones who have access. But if we can turn that around and give them access back, it's their responsibility to do it. So if we can give them a form that says, who's your new starter? When is it starting? What do you need? And they can populate it. All we have to do is make sure that form works. That's the IT's responsibility. We just need to make sure it works. HR will process it. The automation runs because we know exactly what has to happen. They're putting the right information and the right values. And we know exactly that this text equals username. And this text is the email address that they need. And we just take that and run an automation that does it automatically and sends it back to them saying, we're done. Right? So that's the power behind contextualized data. And, and that's uh, the first part that we're going to talk about why Halo is special is because Halo basically allows us to contextualize that data. Everything that we do in Halo from an action or a ticket is essentially a form, whether it's a custom field that we create or an existing field that they created for us to use. doesn't matter. We can completely ignore all of their built-in fields, or we can build custom fields for it. We're, the point is, is that we're contextualizing the information that's going in so that we can then do additional things after that. And additional things is whatever we can think of, literally. Which brings me to the next part of platform versus product. 
When we talk about a product or a tool, we have something that's configured out of the box. It basically does one or two or 10 or maybe 100 or 1,000 things really well. And we can configure things nuanced within each of those areas that it does really well. But it's also very much restricted within the realm that's been set. When we talk about a platform, we're, think, we're talking about something that is completely configurable and customizable to insane ends, to the point of, hold on, before I move on, I just want to check my notes, make sure I didn't skip anything. <laughs> uh, nothing important. OK. To the point of, we can do something like this. This is a native, out of the, out of the box, sort of, dashboard in Halo. This is the dashboard functionality in Halo out of the box. And I guarantee you, if you go to Halo interface and try to build this dashboard, you will not succeed unless you start doing custom things. The fact that we can design custom HTML, so just to be clear, the widgets in the middle is not native Halo. It is displayed natively inside of Halo. It is built purely inside native Halo. It is not referencing anything external, I believe. No. Nope. Right? It's built by Robbie, which is why I looked at him and why I have him <laughs> up here. Um, and for other reasons, too. Uh, but essentially, we can take whatever we want, whatever we can think of, whatever we can imagine, and we can build it as part of native Halo. To the point where like other things that I've done, which are not on the slide, is uh, I've built a function called fo my followed tickets that we pinned to the side pane as a dashboard. And when I showed it to Halo, they actually took it like, this is a good idea. And they adopted it into their trial. And so today, if you go and spin up a trial on Halo, you're going to find there's a side pane dashboard that displays tickets that you're following. That's my fault. You're welcome. <laughs> right? This is native functionality that's now in Halo because we built it. And then Halo decided to adopt it. You can't do that in the standard tool. Right? So this is the difference between platform and product. And the other thing is, and one of the other big points about Halo, is that we can do things like this. Right? Now, you probably can't see that very well. Um, but this is essentially a workflow that we decide our business operates a certain way. If we want the ticket to be processed a certain way, we design a workflow describing outcomes of the ticket and what actions need to happen for that outcome to occur. And this is the core of Halo ticketing, actions versus outcomes, right? where we basically take that flowchart that we design that sits in um, whatever flow charting software you use that probably never gets looked at except for once a year, right? And then every time you look at it, it feels like you're refreshing it. And you're instead building the tool around the actual flow chart. Here's a closer picture of it so we can see, hopefully. We've got the ability to assign the ticket. It flows to the first line. If first line has to escalate to second line, it goes to second line. If it needs to go back to dispatch or it gets resolved, and so on and so forth. We literally take your process and we build Halo around that process which means that the amount of time it takes to train a new employee goes down to next to nothing. Because instead of training them on your processes, you're showing them, here's the tool, press the button that makes sense to you. And assuming you did a decent job in UX design and that buttons make sense, then there's no, process, there's no real training. You know, maybe you have to train what each button does and what each button means, then you just need to revisit your workflows and change the names and stuff. Here's another example of a workflow uh, that I don't have a bigger picture of, unfortunately, I think. Oh, I was the start of it. Yeah. There is. There we go. Look at that. Right? And so it's the same exact. This is an opportunity workflow versus the workflow of a help desk ticket. Right? So it's the same exact concept. One of the key points about data, is, about Halo, is that almost, almost, I should say, almost everything inside of Halo is actually just a ticket. It gets very confusing because they use the word ticket in three different ways, and context matters. And so when we say a ticket, we really mean it could be uh, a ticket, a project, a task, or an opportunity. But in reality, like the back end entity is just a ticket. And so it doesn't matter whether or not you're dealing with a CRM record, whether or not you're dealing with an opportunity, or a ticket, or a project, or a task. It's all just tickets. And the same exact rules apply to all of them. They're driven by actions and outcomes. And they're really just forms that are contextualizing that data. With that being said, I have not been paying attention to the counter. And I was supposed to give you guys a warning first, because um, <laughs> there's been a change in agenda, which you probably heard. Uh, if you're sitting in this room, you're trapped here till 5, basically. Uh, so if I haven't bored you by now, uh, then great. And hopefully, you know, we're at the practical part, and you won't be bored. Yeah, hopefully, hopefully, anyway. 
Um, so we're going to get practical and showcase some things here. And we're going to change the presentation of the monitor to be duplicate. Oh, it is duplicate. Cool. Interesting. Yeah, good. We're good. Cool. Right, so I want to talk about a couple of things first that uh, really talk about a bit of billing in Halo and how it works contextually and how the actual system processes billing um, and see that from both sides, both an MSP owner and how it affects them and how they can build it to handle the complexities of their business and how they've built their agreements over the past 10, 15, 20 years and every customer has their own unique agreement or at least we've got some outliers in there. Um, or especially if you're dealing with something like an acquisition um, and you're taking on uh, a new MSP that uh, worked very differently to you previously. Right? And we need to accommodate, at least for a period of time, those different agreements that those customers have with them. So I'm going to show you a couple of things. First thing I want to show you is a billing template in Halo, which basically allows us to configure how we would like a customer or multiple customers to be billed in the system. So just for my example, I've got uh, three different kind of billing templates here. Um, and the two I want to concentrate on is this uh, managed services, including on-site, and then managed services and IT security, but remote only. Right? And by, billing, by creating these billing templates, what it allows us to do is create rules. And these rules define whether something will be billed as part of a contract, whether it will be billable as an external billable item to the customer, or we could even decide not to bill for it at all. Right? We could even take it out of prepay. There's, there's 100 different options here. And equally, there is many, many options that we can set here to define whether something will be billable or not. And the key part here to understand is, which we'll go through in a moment, is that it doesn't matter to your technician what is in this table. The point of this table is for you as your, the MSP owner and you as the business to define what is going to be included and not included and things which might be externally billable. And for the technician to work exactly the same, irrespective of which customer they're working with, understanding that the system will bill it correctly based on these rules that you've configured. So in this example, I've set here that anything that is IT security is going to go to a uh, pay-as-you-go or is going to be charged as pay-as-you-go. Right? And what that means is any time we do a ticket, which falls into this category of IT security threats, um, it will be billable. Now, what's fantastic about this is we don't need to define the exact category of the ticket. Right? We're not expecting our technicians to jump through this tree and pick the exact thing that's billable. We're just expecting them to pick anything in this IT security threats category. And by selecting anything in that category, this partial match allows us to bill it for that entire category to irrespective of which individual thing it is that it is within that. However, if they're doing anything which is remote support or on-site support, all of that goes to a contract. What that means is when we look at a customer, we can look at Tony's tires here who have a managed services agreement with us, and we can see that they have these billing rules, which allows us to see that both remote support and on-site support is going to hit this customer's contract. So everything support-wise is going to be included. In our other agreement, or our other type of agreement, we're only allowing remote support, um, but we're allowing them to, uh, or we're including IT security threats. Right? Now, shown here again, to uh, prefix this, that anything that is project-related is going to be billable, because that's going to be completely separate to this agreement, um, or that it's going to be billable to them. Um, whereas on-site support, Let's just uh, fix that one. It would have been. It would have been. <laughs> Anything that's on-site support or included within these different categories is going to be included in their contract. So again, it allows us to build the complexity as an owner, and with the technician doesn't need to understand any of this. They just do their ticket exactly as they would do normally. Do we want to? Bill for on site? Yeah, You want to bill for on site? Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. Sorry. So, yeah. But the idea Anything is like, that's... when you're on this screen, if you want, if, when you fix that, scroll back up a little bit. Yeah. One of the things to keep in mind, like we were just talking about contextualizing data, notice the level of, of detail that we can get into. 
And the concept is like these rules will apply in order. If it doesn't match, it's going to go look at the next rule, right? And so it's looking for the data that's been entered, the time that gets entered, and matching against the rules based off the context that was done. And if it matches a rule, it'll apply that billing plan to either invoice or don't invoice or put it against the contract or pull it out of prepay. And so we literally can get to a level, if, if you want to, don't come to me if it doesn't work, but you can <laughs> bill like 100 pages worth of rules to build out your billing. And so therefore, the system will handle the billing logic, and you guys don't have to remember it anymore. Yeah, exactly. So just to take a, uh, a scenario, we're going to pick uh, this ticket over here, where for Terry's Chocolates, this person, unfortunately, their account has been hacked. And again, we're just going to go back to a little bit about the, uh, the process as well. So as a technician, the first thing that comes in, I need to triage that ticket. Right? I need to define what kind of ticket this is. And we see those same categories that we were talking about earlier. And here, I can go not just to IT security threats, but right down to the exact problem that this person is experiencing. Right? And the likelihood is that this has come from a phishing email in this scenario. We can then work on that ticket. Right? Once the ticket has been triaged, you'll see the, the actions change. There's a bunch more stuff that we can do now because we've triaged the ticket. We've given that contextual data to the ticket so that we can um, uh, see it in the future, and we can start to do our work. Right? And I'm going to add a private note here to say that I have, uh, I have fixed the problem. That's as helpful as I ever was as, te as a technician and is as helpful <laughs> as I'm going to be today. Uh, I'm going to update the ticket to be in progress, and we're going to add some remote support as I do that. And you'll see here that this is hitting their contract. So for this customer, this time is included in their contract because they have this separate or this specific IT security contract. Now, this contract for, for this customer only includes four hours. So you'll see that this 15 minutes has taken 15 minutes off that availability from their contract. But we can see that it's drawn against that contract. Now, when we resolve that ticket, I'm going to send poor Terence an email. <laughs> this ticket is not going to show up in our invoicing uh, area to be invoiced to that customer because that time has been captured against their contract. Right? It doesn't show up there. It's Tony's tires that we were looking at. Now, if we take a different example, the exact same scenario, but for a different customer, if I can find it, yeah, Terry Shocklets. So this customer doesn't have one of those IT, oh no, it's not that customer. Sorry, one second. Uh, Just change it. Yeah. <laughs> One of the things to think about when we, when we do data entry, anytime we modify the ticket, the billing logic reruns to yeah. an extent. So you can rerun it manually if you want to. There's a setting that will force it to rerun automatically if the relevant fields change. But if we change the category of a ticket, if we change the client of a ticket, if we change a resolution category, it'll automatically refresh the billing logic so that we don't have to go back and redo it. Right? The key is, again, it drives the automation and it removes that overhead. As long as the back end was set up correctly, then the front end just has to make sure of putting it in the right way, which is already going to be limited in their choices because it's, it's going to be either obvious or it's going to be a limited set of one or two or already defaulted based off of the action they're doing. Yeah. Perfect. So if we look at this uh, customer and said we've got Tony's tires, we've got Ben over here at uh, Tony's tires, um, and he's received the exact same problem. Um, now, as a technician, again, I'm going to work the ticket in the exact same way. I'm going to triage the ticket as a phishing email. I'm going to give my really useful note on the ticket that I have fixed the problem. I'm again going to log my 15 minutes of time that it took me to fix said problem. And I'm going to save it. And something has it went gone to contract. wrong. One moment. <laughs> you did change the billing plan, right? Oh, um, one moment. So again, just to highlight those, uh, the those rules. rules. Ran in order. So yeah. I didn't actually create this uh, correctly initially. You can see remote support and on-site support is included for everything. Now down here, I'm saying that IT security threats are pay-as-you-go. 
But because of those billing rules, it only, as soon as we do some remote support, it hits this first rule in the system of remote support all the time for everything and decides to put it to the contract. Now we can see live if we change this around. It does work, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> in case you're wondering. Let me pop that at number one. And again, just to highlight, we've changed that. Uh, we've changed that now, and we can go back to the ticket. We can recalculate the billing on the ticket, and you'll see now immediately that updates to 15 minutes of build hours. So this time, if we close the ticket off, we can go over to invoicing, go to ready for invoicing, and we can see an additional labor charge has been added. And our ticket that we had here has now been uh, shown as ready to invoice. So we can create an invoice for the customer, and we can invoice them for that time. So the key of showing you that, again, is that as a technician, I don't need to understand any of that. I just need to work the ticket exactly the same for these two different customers, and it will be billed if they need to be billed, and it will not be billed if they don't need to be billed. Cool. That is all of that. Cool. What do you want to talk about next? Do you have any other examples? Okay. Uh, I think that Hold on one second. Yeah, go on. Let's pull up the PowerPoint. So we basically created a set of oh, yeah, challenges. Got the site visit. What? Do that. We'll go through the site visit example. OK, go for that. So Ready? another example we've got is that if a uh, ticket comes in, and uh, again, in this example, we're going to pick these two different customers. And we need to do a site visit for this, right? We've, uh, this person's got a meeting this afternoon. We, their computer won't boot. We, we're going to need to deal with that problem. So we're going to triage the ticket, and we're going to uh, press up our action here to require that a site visit is required. And that's going to trigger an approval process. Now, that approval process is going to be defined, again, the complexity, taking the complexity away from the technician. That approval process is going to be defined by rules. We can define here that if the customer has site visits included, that the ticket is automatically approved, and we can just continue to schedule the uh, site visit, complete the site visit, and move on with our lives. If the customer is only remote, and therefore the, if this is going to be billable work, what we might want to do is uh, start an approval process with somebody who is an approver at the customer. And that way, we can make sure that we're getting approval for going on site before we turn up and end up billing the customer for 300 pounds of work that they didn't want in the first place. Right, so in this example, we've got this site visit required button here. And as soon as I click that, that's going to start our approval process. And you can see now, we're waiting for Connor to approve the ticket. And the ticket has moved to a status of awaiting approval. Now, when Connor comes into the system, um, he'll get an email about this. He'll also be able to log into the self-service portal. Or for now, I'm going to manually override it. We can approve. He can go and approve that work. And the idea here, by the way, is that Connor is not another agent working in your MSP. No. Connor is the client approval approver who's approving billable work. And so that if there is a defined contact at your client that's going to say yes or no to work that's billable, right? we don't have to go track that down. It doesn't have to go to anyone first. It's going to get, they're going to get an email. It's going to say, hey, work was requested to be on site. It's billable. Do you want to approve it? Yes or no? Here are the details. And the client can, from that email, choose approve or deny. Or they can just reply back with the word approved, and sometimes that works if you're lucky. And it'll automatically approve that process so that then they can move on to the next step in the technician. And if the client is of a contract that includes on-site work, it just skips that completely and just approves it automatically. The process your technician follows is the same exact thing every single time. They click the button. They wait for the approval. Whether that happens automatically or via client, they don't care. And they just then go and complete that work at that point. Yep, exactly. So just to, uh, again, prove the point, we're going to right-click and accept that ticket. And you can see the status in this case is going to be updated to approved. We're going to see the approval come into the ticket. If there was any additional notes, which the uh, user can provide via the self-service portal as well, um, they would appear here as well. So again, if they were asking us to come at a specific time or date, all of that can be brought back into the ticket, again, for our agent to work on. Now, in our second example, exact same ticket. 
Um, exact same scenario, but a different customer that has on-site visits included because they're one of our full MSP clients that bought into our whole process. Um, again, if we triage this ticket, as exactly the same thing, and we're going to request the site visit, you can see there it was instant. And that's because, the, again, in this case, they don't need to approve on-site visits because it's included in their contract. It's up to us to decide um, to do that, and therefore, it's immediately approved. And the point of showing you this again is that this isn't just for site visits. This can be used in absolutely any scenario in your business. If you can build a workflow that has an action button where the agent can request approval, that approval can be internal, it can be external, it can be uh, agents, it can be users, it can be a one-step process, it can be a 10-step process, if you like. The ability to build that complexity, again, all comes away from their technician, and they just get to do the same thing in the same way and expect the same outcome. Do you want to show the actual approval rules? Like yes. What it looks like. Yeah, you're going to see that it's basically the same exact thing. The same concepts that we've just drilled regarding tickets and actions and context, it's going to be the exact same thing. The same context in the billing template that we can apply for the billing rules, we can apply in the process, approval process rules as well here. Yep, exactly. So in this case, this is uh, our, we've got a symbol, single step approval process. Um, so this is just the, uh, the step called client approval, and this is approved by approval process rules. Now, the way that we're doing this is that we're defining if the top level of the customer, if the grouping of the customer is our full MSP clients, which we know get full on-site and remote support included, then down here, it will be approved automatically. Before you close that, yep. I just want to show, like, sorry. Um. Regarding the, like, the context that we just described, right, and how, I guess I can't edit, but regarding the context of what we were just talking about and how every data gets assigned to a property, a field, a custom field, or an internal field that we create, here's a list of them, and I'll try to go slow, but like, literally anything that's on the ticket, any value that goes into the ticket can be used to determine what should be done with this ticket and this rule, right? And I'm just continuously scrolling. It's... it's I can go faster. There we go, finally stopped, right? And so like, essentially, we can take anything, any data that exists can be structured, molded, and turned into a driver for automation and process enforcement for reporting. And that's the, th the key thing that I just want to keep driving and nailing over and over and over again, is that if you can think about it and find a way to, to, to structure it, we can do it. Uh, and that's really the point of the deep dive in Halo overall. But yeah, you can go on with the... Good. Yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> so again, um, in our, uh, so in this scenario, again, we've got our customers that are covered under contract. And if they're not covered under contract, so the top level is our remote-only clients, um, then it's going to be approved by the change approvers at the tickets client, so the change approvers of that client. Now, that can be even specified uh, further. We don't need all change approvers. We could be looking at change approvers who have a certain role. We can define that level of approval right down to new starter approvers and uh, permissions changes approvers. We can get as granular as you like and, again, split that down into our different customers. The approval processes, by the way, when I talk to my clients about them, are usually the area when they go like, wow, holy crap. <laughs> um, just to show this again, like here's a like several of the options. If you notice, there were a bunch before I started filtering. But we got determine the agent approver from a custom field. If we want to approve the ticket from an internal agent, we can basically say, if a custom field has a value, we're going to use that value to determine who the approval should be on the agent side. Or we can say, determine the user from a custom field, or determine an uh, approver email address from the custom field. So we can literally take a custom field that we create and just put whatever value you want in there, such as an email address or a name of a person, and that becomes the approval based off of a set of rules. And so if you're imagining the level of depth that we're getting into here, we're basically chaining multiple dimensions together to then decide what is the next process step. Are we gonna go on to the next step of the approval? Um, Rob, you mentioned this is a single step and a single approval process. Yep. We can actually chain multiple approval processes together, and each approval process can have multiple approval steps within them. And so there's essentially a, a large amount of flexibility, an almost limitless amount of flexibility that we can do here. Um, just to give you that same scrolling effect, oh, I clicked on something. This is the level of options available, and again, scrolling slowly, in terms of what the approvers can be aside from the custom fields. Um, team leader, 
uh, you approve automatically is what we're using on the other one, right? To make sure that it can just be done by the system. Related assets, business owner or technical owner, assigned account manager, or again, the custom fields that we saw. Um, and so there's essentially a, a large amount of power and flexibility here that we can drive based off of, um, again, the data that we're structuring and the processes that we know and should already have in our business that up until now have always been on paper. Yeah, and this also allows you to um, come, bring your customers into the system in a way that works for them. Right? We, we used to have a customer that, um, on new starters, they needed to have a four-step approval process. It needed to be um, approved by an admin person who would approve the actual details of the thing. It needed to be approved by HR. It then needed to be approved by a finance person if there was some kind of purchase in place, which, again, we could build rules around. And then, finally, it needed to be approved by the CEO. And we were able to accommodate that because we could specify a rule that would change the approval process very specifically for that customer to do exactly what they needed it to do, while also keeping it simple for the rest of our clients who didn't need a four-step approval process. Um, and this is, again, going back to that idea of a platform versus a product. You need to configure all this stuff, of course. But the platform allows you to do that and get as complex as you can dream. Cool. You have our next example? I think. Did we have it? Should have printed these out, right? We're too much we're too used to computers. We're all IT people. I think that's everything that we had on our side. Okay. So at this point, um, our next step is opening it up to you guys. Like I mentioned, we have you trapped here for another half an hour or so. Um, the question is going to be what do you want to see? I don't know if we need the slideshow for it, because we're going to be inside of Halo. But, yeah. <laughs> uh, what do you guys want to see? Like, uh, are there any questions that we have that you have for us? Yes, go ahead. Following on from that example you've just given, where um, that particular ticket needs an on-site visit, obviously that would be some knock engineer who's dealing that, with that centrally. Once you have clicked that um, assign, uh, requires on-site visit and it's been approved, is there a way then to automatically reassign that ticket to, say, a set of field engineers who can then go off and deal with that ticket? Or did it stay with that assigned engineer to go and do it? Yes, I understand the question. So uh, for the purposes of the recording, if they did it, if they said they would be recording, the question is basically, like, once the approval process happens, is there a way to send the ticket off to the correct team that should be dealing with it? Or is it just going to stay on the agent who requested that approval in the first place? Great question. I'm going to give you a little bit of a tip that's probably going to be dangerous. I'm going to say it anyways. If you're going to ask a question of can you do something in Halo, the answer is probably going to be yes. Um, and so maybe ask, like, how can we do that? And I'll show you how we can do that. But absolutely, that is something that we can do uh, through. My, my, my question was, how would you do it then? Yes, how would you do it? We're going to show you that. Absolutely. Uh, do you know how to do that? Go on, you go. Okay. You go this one. All right. You do this one. So there's a couple different ways that we can do this. Um, Obviously, I obviously know as well. But yeah, this is, this is clearly something I'm not making up right now on the spot, uh, I think. Anyways, which one was it? The on-site client approval? Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, you're just lucky we're not pulling this guy up onto stage with us. Um, OK, so <laughs> <laughs> inside the approval step itself, right? We have, this is where we define this, the process that's going to determine who the approver is. right? But once we have the approver selected, we then have what happens. We have the email that's going to go out. We can control what that email looks like. Each approval process can have a different email template that goes out. Um, and whether or not we email the agent and the user, that can be determined as well. But once that approval is done, we have the outcome here. And one of the options that we have is the ability to assign to unassigned if approved. Or we can say to assign to the approver. Or we can say um, that's really it as far as the assignments are on this step. Or what we can do is on the action level, sorry, Robbie. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> is I love touch screens sometimes. Yes, Florian, I do like touch screens. Within the action itself, if you filter that for the approval, go for it. Within the action itself, we can define who the next reassignment is. And so we can, we can populate who the ticket's going to go to once that's done. So if there is a team that does the assignment, right? especially if you have something with like load balancing automatically turned on, uh, which then load balances automatically for any tickets that's unassigned, we can have the approval process, move it to the team, 
that then goes to unassigned, or we can move it to, uh, to the agent who's going to be approving, or we can leave it on that agent and do the assignment afterwards in a rule. Um, there, there's basically unlimited different ways to do what you're asking. Uh, but within the action itself here, the default team and agent right here, we can move the team on a very basic level. We can just move the team to that team. And so that when the approval happens, they know it hits their queue saying approved, needs to go on site, and they just go ahead and do it at that point. And again, we can either load balance it if we want to. I don't know if it's on. Uh, it's not on, but I can go and turn it on. OK, go for it. Correct. Yep. One thing I really like about here is obviously the integration with my Outlook calendar and my engineers Outlook calendar. Mm -hmm. Would that then create an Outlook item so that they would know? So, if, for example, field engineers might not necessarily be logging into Halo every day. But sure. Looking at the phone to see what tickets have been assigned to them. Would then that create that um, appointment within their calendar so that they can say, oh, I need to go to Ron's tires? Yeah. Yeah, not without additional configuration, but it is doable, uh, obviously, right? Everything is. But uh, we would basically, like, one of the things that we can do is we can set a start date, target date on that ticket. Um, and so we had mentioned approval processes, and the approver can decide when we want to come out or something like that, right? The, we have the ability to prompt for fields. And I don't actually know if start date, target date's included in those fields. <laughs> but we have the ability to prompt for fields. When they go to approve it, they have to choose, they can populate values. And so one of the things they can potentially populate is start date, target date. If those two are set and an and agent is assigned, Halo can automatically generate an appointment for that agent for that time period. And then that'll sync back to Outlook immediately. It's a real-time push uh, using webhooks. And so that'll immediately show up on our calendar at that point. All right. And then something else that I'll throw in there as a small bonus is that load balancing can take into account the appointments on the agent's calendars. And so it will not assign a ticket to an agent if they're in a status that excludes them from load balancing. And that status is set by the appointment. Um, so we can really get very granular with that load balancing to make sure that we essentially you know, obliterate the dispatcher's job. You know, hopefully it doesn't hurt anyone here. <laughs> uh, any other questions? Yeah, Dan, corner. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. So one of the things that that Halo uh, is built on the foundation of is that every ticket that exists has to have a single agent and a single user associated to it on either side. That's like the, the foundation of a ticket. And so who is the responsible agent that's scheduling that appointment is going to be the first question. So they'll have the ability, when they schedule a, a, an appointment, to have look at the booking, whatever it's called, that booking window. Resource booking. The yeah. resource booking window that allow them to see agents and their calendars, and they can schedule multiple agents on their end with the user at that point. So they can get on with the user, and they can do that. Alternatively, they can do resource booking, although I don't know if that's one at a time. Does resource booking allow you to do multiple agents? No. OK, so maybe not resource booking right now, but this guy can take it down as a feature request. <laughs> <laughs> he thought I didn't see him, and he was like creeping his way into the room. You know? <laughs> I think the other thing I'd like to touch on on that is um, you talk about different products. And that's just one way in which uh, you could define different workflows for your tickets. Right? So again, that opportunity workflow um, with the steps that you need to go to to go from uh, new leads to sold um, purchase is uh, configurable at any level you want it to be, including which products you're actually deciding to sell. Right? So we have a uh, completely different workflow depending on if you're doing a managed services opportunity versus a quick quote. Right? A quick quote has three steps. A managed services opportunity has about 9, 10. Right? And again, by driving the different workflow that you're choosing for that 
um, opportunity, you can then define whether that step is required or not. And you can, again, make it required. So your salesperson can't just choose to not do it. Um, they have to have that appointment, and they have to include somebody else in that um, when they do so. Yeah. Actually, there was another example we wanted to build out, but it was a bit complicated, and I don't know if Robbie knew about it. But um, <laughs> so it was an example I wanted to build out. Like a common scenario that happens, especially with larger, more built-out, you know, sales teams and stuff like that, uh, is that you give the sales guy a little bit of leeway, or sometimes too much leeway, in defining the terms of contract with the client, and they have the ability to potentially like rewrite half the contract almost but they can't actually sign it. It has to go through an approval process. And so like, one of the common things that we hear in this scenario is that the person who is approving the actual final contract has to read through the entire freaking thing of like 50 pages to figure out what was changed exactly. You know? Or they have like, maybe a red line document, but they're still going through to, to find all the different nuances to see whether or not all the terms are approved. What we can do within Halo, with the more complicated opportunity workflow, is we can, again, coming back to the concept of structuring and contextualizing the data, we can set terms that the salesperson cannot change, and we can set a very specific area that they can change, that they have to check a box to say, I am changing this area, before they're allowed to change it. What that does is, number one, it gives us the ability to structure the contract. Any terms that need to be reviewed, the person who's approving it knows exactly where to look. It's always in the same place. And the second thing is, is that because they're checking a box, we can now drive an approval process on it. And so if they're selling a new client and they haven't touched terms, today, without this process, the person approving it is approving and reviewing every single contract anyways. With this process and the checkbox, if they don't check the box, an approval process is not required, and they can just go and sell that client, saving a significant amount of time on the person who's usually the CEO or somewhere higher, uh, higher up who has agency of the organization, they don't have to review it anymore because it's not been changed. And they know that because they didn't check the box. Right? So coming back to the concepts, again, with structured, contextualized data, there's a lot of things that we can do that drives the process. And the goal is to remove as much overhead time as possible. Uh, anything that we're doing specifically to support processes in the business is silly. Like having a process on a process is, is just dumb, a waste of time, in my opinion. Um, but that's, that's the goal that we want to get to. When we have structured data and we have uh, the, the dimensions built out and we have the approval processes built in and, and stuff like that, we can do a lot of that stuff automatically. Um, who else had questions? Um, I, was, I was watching one of your videos a while back on um, the AI, when OpenAI came out. Sure. And you it was very much finding our way around, effectively, how yep. it was put together. And there's been big strides from Halo. Yes. Yep. But at the time, it was like finding finality of tickets, yep. classifying, all that sort of yep. stuff. So um, you know, given that structured data and that, then using that data for something, my question is kind of quite open, which is what kind of things do you see the AI, that, that open AI element being used for, where it really is helping sort of the teams move forward to get going? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so the, the question was, like, with structured data, how does that assist the AI, and what new things have we seen AI being used for to help the team do stuff? Um, I was waiting for someone to ask an AI question, so thank you. Uh, I also, I had, a, I had a guy ask me once about something I said on a video, and I'll just say that line I replied back right now, just so everyone is aware in case it comes up later. I don't remember anything I ever say, like five minutes after I say it. <laughs> All right, so like, that's how you know if I say, if you ask me something one time and you come back 10 minutes later, ask me again, I say the same answer, it's probably right. You know, if it's a different answer, then maybe something, you know, I was wrong one of the times. I don't know, it happens. Um, but uh, so thank you for not asking a question on the video because I don't really remember what was on that video. But um, to answer your question specifically, uh, number one, I want to point out it's not really related uh, to your actual question, but one of the things regarding AI that makes, it, that, that makes it more accurate is providing context, right? And so because our data is structured in Halo, we can actually take the, the, the related specific values and build that context to the AI prompts, right? It allows us to drive things further at that point. Um, to your actual question, what have we actually seen that's been helpful? Um, I can tell you what I've seen that looks like it will be helpful in the future. 
uh, I, I've seen some really cool things, uh, but it's basically all the same uh, functionality. It's just different levels of accuracy. Uh, but like Thread, for example, is doing automatic prioritization and categorization of tickets, right? So depending on how accurate that is, which when we did some quick testing, it looked really good. Um, but depending on the accuracy of that, if we have a problem still where the technician has to choose the category of the ticket, especially if we have a complex MSP where we've got different levels of different levels of service that are covered and not covered, depending on the contract of the client, right? It's, there's still room for error there for the technician to potentially choose the wrong category. It's not the end of the world. We can really, we can really build our categorization list to be very, very specific and easy and, and intuitive and so on and so forth. But there's still that room for error. And so AI can come into play and make sure that that does it really well. There is the, the concept of AI surfacing solutions up. Um, there is built into Halo and some of the later versions is the ability to tie into Azure Search. And so the vectorization that happens is now on the Azure Search engine, not within the Halo database which I, I mean, assuming it makes it more accurate and better. And that'll also vectorize knowledge base articles that are inside of Halo and surface that up as well. Right? So there are some really cool things around that. I've not tested it out because I'm not paying for Azure Search uh, just to try it out. You know, it's just not going to happen. But the functionality is there. Um, some of the other things that exist out of the box right now, which I have tried, and there's a, there's a newer version of that video that you saw, if you want to go back and, and watch it. Um, but there does emotion detection, which is really cool. Um, you know, there's uh, CSAT tools that are really great, but how often are they actually clicking on the, on the responses? Right? Versus um, how often is when the client is clicking on the response, are they remembering their overall satisfaction as opposed to their individual satisfaction with that ticket? Right? So the AI emotion detection, what it does when you turn it on is it actually analyzes the entire conversation within that ticket, and it rates the the uh, satisfaction level and sentiment of the user from that entire conversation for that specific ticket, which allows us to build a historical view, uh, like a trending line of how much that client really hates us or loves us. You know, hopefully they love us. Um, or it also allows us to build a trending line of how annoying that client is at any given point in time, right? Because it's basically taking for every single ticket within that client, which allows us to build a report around it. Um, that's something that I do show uh, as well. Something else that we can do is the knowledge base article you saw on my previous screenshot. Um, so by the way, like everything that we're showing here, uh, this is Halo running directly off this laptop, just FYI. So anyone who's like in the uh, larger space that requires for um, compliance purposes and on-premise, like you can just walk around with it. Like if you're paranoid and you want to make sure you keep your data safe, you can just run it on your laptop and keep it. Uh, but just don't tell Halo I told you that. Um, so. <laughs> The, the thing is, like, this is not, like, the screenshots that I showed you was my actual live Halo that I run Rising Tide on. So in that screenshot, there was a close action, and I had a generate AI KB article for, right? I can take that, that, that generate AI article checkbox, and we, can, we basically tell AI, here's the problem, because we have it contextualized. Here's the resolution. Now generate a KB article around both. Right? So it gets really accurate. Instead of just saying, here's a ticket, generate a KB article, and then it's talking about like, the back and forth discussion that happened. Right? Like, that article is not really helpful. <laughs> right? so you have to get really specific in your prompts. But if you, if you send it the right data and say, like, build an article, you can do that. And then the other thing is, because Halo is a platform, we really haven't talked about runbooks at all, but yes. because Halo is a platform, we can take that response, and instead of making a KB article inside of Halo, you know, which you know, it's a knowledge base repository. It's not the greatest, per se, but it's there. Instead of putting it there, we can take the response and put it anywhere else that has an API, like Kudu or ITGlue or something like that. So we can literally build our knowledge base article out um, from, from Halo's ticketing into the correct place if we wanted to. Uh, to that end, the reverse side, because it's going to come back, you just talked about Azure searching with knowledge base articles. How does that work? <laughs> right? On the reverse side, we can have a webhook that fires off from IT glue or Hudu or whoever that your document is being created that synchronizes the document into Halo. We really don't care what it looks like or where it ends up. We just care that it's there so that the AI engine can process it. So that when they are doing a ticket, the search engine surfaces that knowledge base article up, and the technician opens it up, and there's a link to the main article or the information is right there in their face if it's readable, right? depending on the format and whatever is in there. 
Um, so that's just, uh, I think, some of your answer. Awesome. Who's next? I scared you all away, huh? Oh, sorry. Yes. Mm-hmm. He has multiple sides. Yep. But he is within the top level. Yep. Alongside company B. Sure. And that contract. Yep. Attends to a few sides of company A. Yep. And a few sides of company B. Okay. That's the first level of complexity that I tried to to. Yeah. How would you measure that properly without using that much uh, uh, too much custom fuels, customizations, or mm-hmm. things like that? Yeah. Once the site is, for example, the contract is within the client site, yeah. not the top level yep. site. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So here's a rule I tell my clients all the time, right? You can't get complex and then complain about the complexity. Uh, but there is a way to do what you're saying, right? So uh, with that being said, within the billing plan, um, if you go into a customer's, don't do it on template. It wouldn't be, you would not template this out, right? So we kind of skipped over this part with the billing plans. But these billing plan combinations that exist are templated on a global level, right? But then they're also assigned to a client, right? So what you're describing, we would not template on a global level because it doesn't make sense, right? It's a very specific use case for a very specific set of clients. And so what we would do is in the billing plan, if you go out of billing rule here and scroll all the way down, we would choose a contract from the billing plan, scroll further, where is the billing uh, plan? This is in the contract, sorry, one second. Oh, yeah, do, do, OK, yeah, yeah, do on the client level. All right, so uh, billing rules, add a billing rule, scroll down to the billing plan. And then what we would do is we would allow other customer contracts to be chosen, right? And so we can basically store a contract under one customer location and reference other clients for very specific use cases to use the other contract, right? The same rules apply in the billing template or the billing plan, right? So we can say, if, if the ticket is a specific type or a specific type of work or whatever, then use the other client's contract at that point, right? Something else that I'll say, like I mentioned, we wouldn't template this out. What we would do is we'd template 90% of it out, right? So I don't know if anyone is familiar with Roost or Aaron Chernin and his constant drive and automation and automate 80%, you know, don't go for the whole thing and it's a journey and so on and so forth. The same exact rules apply here. Um, because we work off iteration, and it's a platform that you're constantly designing, right? You're constantly adjusting as you grow and as you change. So what I would say for this template is even though this specific use case has where you'd use the other contract, there's probably going to be other types of work that has other rules that are more standard. So what you can do is you can apply a billing template, which applies most of the rules. And then if you change that billing template to none, the rules stay the same. So I would still template out 90% of the template, right? apply the template, switch it back to none, and then just do the specific overrides for that client. OK? Anyone else? I can't see all the hands. Come on, we've got 17, 16 minutes left. <laughs> What's up? Uh-huh. Yeah. Halo by itself, without any additional tools. Right. Well, that's the question. So yeah, exactly that. So how far can you go in Halo, and then what other tools would you need to add in there to kind of really get to the point where, like you use it, they can do that, request that, and actually it just sends the email back saying, here's the user password. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So you watch my videos, you know that I have a bunch of videos on Roost, right? Like th- with Halo and Roost paired together, there's nothing you can't do uh, with that level of 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 because a Roost is an automation engine that is really well built out and ties into almost every other product that an MSP would ever use. Right? And additionally, if you, if you do use a product that it doesn't tie into, you can build a custom integration really easily and just uses the same flows and stuff like that. Be- the key thing behind Halo, and we didn't really drive into this, even though the talk was originally supposed to be about the APIs and automation and AI uh, before I changed it. Um, <laughs> the the 
key thing to know about Halo is that the front end you see here, this is not Halo. This is, this is a shell. This is a web interface that does nothing but read results from an API and display it in various ways. The key part to Halo is the API engine. And whatever we do in the interface, if I log in, if I pull up a, a ticket, if I do an action on a ticket, if I change a client, anything that I do in the, in the engine is literally just an API call. Right? It's the exact same API that we would use to automate is the API that they use in the interface. It's literally just a shell. It's a wrapper around the API engine. I say this over and over again. I talk to a lot of vendors, and I help them integrate to Halo. And this is the part that I say the most that they always have trouble getting. They don't realize that if you drop into development tools and you perform an action, you literally get the entire API call and everything that you need to perform that action yourself. And so the biggest complaint I hear about Halo and API and integrating is lack of API documentation. Right? Well, we all know Halo's documentation isn't the best anyways. Sorry, Aiden, if you're here. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> even, even without documentation on the API side, you don't need it. With development tools, assuming you're, you've authenticated, which is the hardest part to the API is authentication, and it's very easy. Right? It follows the OAuth 2.0 standard. So assuming you've authenticated, the only thing you need is development tools and the ability to know how to do it inside of the browser. I had a conversation with MSP CFO. Uh, you guys are probably familiar with that product for financial reporting and stuff like that. And they were talking about, they were integrating to Halo, and I showed them, like they said, I'm having trouble getting these fields. And I showed them exactly what I just said in developer tools. The developer guy was like, if I had known this six months ago, I would be done by now. <laughs> right? Like, this is the thing that I keep trying to say. Like, the developer tools will show you everything that's going on. You don't need documentation. And the key to this is like, how far can you go? With Halo itself, you can already go very far. Halo has a mini automation engine, or automation light engine. They call runbooks and custom integrations, and it works about half the time. It also doesn't have all the functionality and features built in, but it's something that they're actively working on, right? It's, <laughs> it's... <laughs> I'm not saying anything Morgan doesn't already know, by the way, just so you know, right? Like, I'm not saying, so, and just, just FYI, before, I do see your questions in the back, I'll get to you in a second, but just, just FYI, when Roost came out with custom integrations, they locked it behind a flag because they said, we are not supporting anyone who wants to build a custom integration. It's impossible for us to support every single API in existence. I can't do that. So the only way you get this custom integration is if we lock it behind a flag and you have to agree not to bother our support team when you use it, right? Halo's like, we don't care. Boom, here you go, run books, custom integrations. And it's a relatively brand new feature. Like, I'm not expecting it to be fully functional and working it the way it does right now, which is already pretty well for the most part. Um, but, so I'm just, I'm just clarifying that part, right? Like, the things that, that I do, I, I have like half my automations in custom run books and half my automations in Roost. So, as far as how far you can go, with Halo by itself, you can already go very far. If you have to do any kind of data transformation, or we're going to say this value equals that value, or this value equals another value in a different specific format or object, then that's the part you're going to get into trouble with. Um, one of my videos I have is literally called Abusing Halo's API. Uh, so it allows you to basically run SQL uh, inside uh, through the API, right? With the SQL engine behind it, you have a lot more uh, options because SQL can do data transformation to a limited extent. And so with that, Again, we can go really, really far already with just Halo by itself. But with Roost, if you guys have Roost and Halo together, you can do whatever you want, literally. They were first, I think. <laughs> Somewhere back there. That is a great question. Uh, I'm assuming there is, because the interface does it. I just don't know what that call is, and I don't know if it's protected. So one of the things that Halo does, which is really awesome, if you're hosted by them, they throw a bunch of crap in it along with it for free. 
And so like one of the things that they do with their images, uh, it wasn't always done this way, but they've recently or semi-recently moved the storage to S3 backend, like object storage backend, right? Which if you're on-premise, you can't have. So yeah, so he's going to paste it in right now and see if he can capture the API call that gets used to upload it. Um, control shift S or Windows key shift S to grab a screenshot. You share X. <laughs> Robbie's using my laptop and he's not happy with it. Yeah, I can't, I can't see anything on the projector, but. Uh, there's a post to the image, to attachments image with the payload of an image. Oh yeah, there's a binary file. So there's an API call. Again, developer tools is your friend. All right, go to DevTools, do the actual action, and capture, you'll see the request that gets made, and what happens? Is it a request to the normal API endpoint, or? Yeah, post to attachment image with a payload of the file, file, which will be the, the actual file itself. There you go. Um, we should let you do it. The URL, what does the response yep. have? A link there you go. The There's a link to the image that you can then put into the actual document. Perfect. Thank you. All right, awesome. Uh, yes? Yeah, data transformation, yep. That'd be really good, Morgan. Yeah. So, so <laughs> yes. if, if we really... Yes, wouldn't it, Morgan? If we Definitely. really want to put pressure on Morgan, I'll tell you that the, the, literally the moment the runbook feature came out, I don't know if I should say this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, I, I emailed Tim, and I'm like, Tim, what's going on with this thing? Tim Bowers, to be clear. And Tim's like, immediately chucked to Morgan, like, Morgan, you handle this, right? <laughs> Uh, I went to Morgan and I, I'm like, listen, this looks like cool and it's good and it's a great first start, but like, here's a list of things that it needs to happen for us to be, actually be able to use it. And it was like, a, I don't know, like a page and a half email um, of features. One of was data transformation. So he's, he's already, he already knows. Yeah, well, yeah. And to clarify, um, firstly, what we're going to be doing is stand up for It was the last time you got this. <laughs> Expecting Halo to come out of the gate, V1 runbooks being as good as Roots. Yeah, absolutely it's not. Automation platform. Halo has got an automation engine inside of the PSA platform. Yeah. But also that being said, we have made various improvements. Yes. So when runbooks first came out, we didn't have things like array. Array iteration. Yep. Yep. Um, there's two points I'm going to talk about tomorrow. One was Robbie's request about using output variables in other output variables. Yes. Yep. We That'll have be a big difference. Form of data manipulation as well, so you can, based on the, the type of variable that you have, mm -hmm. say if it's this value, convert it to that value. Um, and more broadly speaking, Halo's development strategy is, uh, you know, it's it's a work in progress. It's a moving target. Yeah. Uh, with bi-weekly releases, yep. you can't make it the best automation engine day one. Yeah. But you'll see if you go back through the release notes, you'll see where it was. I don't even know how long it's been out, maybe like a year, just over a year, where it was then, where it is now, and again, where it's going to be in a year's time. Yeah. It's, so it is true. Like, it, obviously, it's true. He's saying it. But just to reiterate, <laughs> just to reiterate, uh, Halo's entire development strategy has always been about iteration, right? And so like, if you, and we were all IT guys at one point in time. You remember, like, oh, when Windows comes out with a new version, nobody runs on it, right? We always wait for the first service pack before we actually run on that version of Windows, unless we're crazy, right? And so it's the same idea where, like, version one is going to come out. It's going to be accomplishing a very specific feature uh, or a very specific use case. And then they iterate it over time that gets more and more, right? So, like, we're not expecting it to be as good as Roost no matter what, out of the box. Uh, because Roost today is different than when it was out of the box, right? So there's always iteration that occurs. Um, but, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, just to show off a little bit of what runbooks can do. There's a couple of examples here. We can do full new user automation. Um, in this case, we're using uh, SIP, um, which m most of you have probably heard of. Um, <clears throat> that allows us, again, we're going to collect those details as part of the form, going right back to the start of the talk, right? We're talking about filling out a form. Now, I'm going to do it on the agent side here, but um, obviously, this could also be done by your users. Um, and we're going to bring in a new starter, uh, Morgan. <laughs> Hey, Morgan, um, you've been hired. Yeah. <laughs> it's finally managed to get a job. And, uh, <laughs> and um, 
again, just to, try, to show you some of that uh, stuff that we can do with the forms, these sites here are pulled from the sites that that customer has. Right? We're not just pulling a bunch of sites. This also isn't a form that I filled out these four different sites. This is actually the sites for that customer in Halo. So we create their data in one place. We do the thing that we have to do anyway, which is make those sites. We don't have to repeat that work in 100 forms for 100 different customers. We just pull the right data. Again, in the same vein, we can pull the departments. And this is a, a list of all the unique departments across all of our users in Halo. It's not a list of departments that that customer has. It's the actual departments, different departments that they use. Um, and even picking things like new us or users from other users and users that exist inside of that Halo environment. Um, Mendy's already been created via this process before, by the things. Um, and again, we can even with SIP go as far as copying a user's permissions. Right? So we can pick a user um, to copy permissions from. And uh, we've been playing around with, we're not quite quite there yet, but we should be able to apply Microsoft 365 licenses. Once Ben and Jack and their, their, uh, the SIP side make a few changes, we can actually apply licenses as well. Now, we can go as far as building, again, processes in here where if we uh, request uh, the license check from SIP, and if there's no licenses available, we can kick out and say, go buy a license first. Right? We could even go as far as potentially buying a license, but the main point is um, we've got that flexibility. Now, again, in this scenario, there's an approval process that needs to happen here. One of these four people need to approve this ticket. I'm just going to override it and approve it for them now. And fingers crossed, I've not looked at this in at least a month. <laughs> this should <laughs> go ahead and create a user for us. <laughs> so there's a couple of things that are off out of the box that I always turn on. But at yes. some point, I'll email Morgan and be like, this should be included in the new trials. But in ticket type settings, we've got display the automations tab. We've got display the billing tab. We've got display the audit log. We generally want those on. The event log we want on as well, usually. Um, and so we can always then see, basically, are you going to those? Yeah, these are the two settings, again, yeah. at ticket type level. In the forms tab, for some reason, which I can explain. Um, it makes sense <laughs> if you understand the Halo A. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, we've got the automations tab and the, the auditing tab. The event log tab is uh, slightly different. It's to do with notifications. Yeah. So that's under here. Um, and it's a global setting uh, just shown for admins. But what that yeah. does is it gives us this automations tab. It also gives us an event log tab for any events that have happened, a new user, um, or an, an audit log, which shows us the entire history of that ticket. And so it's currently running. It's or running. It, it's finished. And if we go back that. into the ticket, we, we can user. see that it's created the user. There, there's their username. We've got a link to password push with their um, password in. Um, there's also an error there, which is just that it's failed to add them to a group. The likelihood is I can almost guarantee that that's a uh, dynamic group, so we don't actually need to add them to that group, which is why it failed. And just, so, just so we can see that we didn't just build an automation that just puts an action back into the ticket. <laughs> yeah. Right? We're going to show you, like, here's the actual password push URL of that password that was generated. And so this is an automation that's actively working. Yep. Um, so yeah, like how far can you go? Like, you can already go really, really far with native Halo by itself. One of the things I do want to drill into that, that Robbie like, brushed over, but uh, I forgot about, was really good, was in that form, right? we are presenting options regarding department, regarding, um, what was it, what else? Like other uh, users? The users, the line manager. The line manager, um, right? And sites. so the key thing here is that we would talk about platform versus product, right? The, the key is that when we iterate, we don't want to ever do any kind of work that means we're going to have to come back to it. So if there's a way that we can essentially drive choice based off of existing values that are going to automatically update in the future, we want to use that option. What am I talking about? Because I just said a lot of abstract things. Under the custom field itself, one of the options we can do when you do a single or multiple selection custom field is we can do a dynamic field based off of a SQL query, which allows us to do a query on the database to say, show me all the departments in use by this client. And then as you automatically add users to a department, then it will automatically add it to the list for every other use case. Like Robbie said, we don't have to go update in 15 different forms that use that field. Right? It's a, a dynamic SQL query that will always run. And so as you add users, as you add sites, as you add locations, or anything else, even if you're doing a custom field, you do another custom field off of it, we can still do that. We can do essentially chaining custom fields with dynamic SQL queries so that we're always collecting the latest information and we're not repeating the work more than once. Um, so that's yep. 
something else. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, exactly. Um, and again, the, these might look, uh, certainly if, you've not, uh, if you're not a Halo customer today, these are definitely going to look slightly intimidating to you. Even if you are, this might be complex. You might not be a SQL expert. We have got, and if you're in the Discord, there is a bunch of these that we've made and we've stuck in a, a doc site that you can go and find and pick that have got uh, obvious uh, explanations as to what they are. Um, but the other thing that I wanted to show um, with that as well is that we can start to give the user more information than they would, they would otherwise have. So with our license selection here, um, you may have seen earlier that it showed zero available. Well, what we've actually done here is, again, using SQL, is appended on the count of licenses which is available right now, which is synced on a daily basis currently, but potentially more often than that with Delta Query soon. Um, with the live license count essentially for that customer. So that means when somebody comes to the form, they already have an understanding that there's none available, and therefore they're likely going to need to purchase a license, right? They're already, the customer's already prepped for the idea that they're going to have to purchase a license um, before they're doing it, um, and that might you know, change their behaviors and change what they want to do. And I think we've somehow managed to fill we made it to an the hour end. and a half. <laughs> Did you guys feel trapped? Thank you.